It seems extraordinary that there's nothing that the coronavirus doesn't touch. Black Lives Matter demonstration. Oppression is brought out. So unfortunately, because I just feel like we're, we're going down this road, we've been down this road before. Hello and welcome to Your Voice. I'm Ted Kofi. Take a stroll through the public spaces in London and England and you will hear many foreign languages spoken. After all, London is the most cosmopolitan city in the world with black and minority ethnic groups numbering 3.3 million being 40% of its population. But you will hear few people publicly speaking African languages. When they do, it'll be spoken between adults and rarely between African adults and their children. Now, statistics are not available for how many children from the diaspora speak their mother tongues. But with evidence that speaking the mother tongue aids the intellectual and emotional development of children, we wonder why this is so. Children of the diaspora in the UK are frequently reported as falling between two stools. While they have English or British nationality, many born here or arriving here at a young age often feel alienated from British culture while having weak roots in their ancestral cultures. Now, as language is a key tool for maintaining a link with cultural heritage, we ask whether African children in the diaspora should learn their ancestral languages and whether we should be worried that more of them don't speak those tongues. As always, this is your show, your voice, your shout. So please do get in touch and have your say via the number we'll be playing on the screen below. Now here to help resolve this problem are people who have both lived and researched these issues. Children's author and founder of Afroclectic, Isabella Wobi Mensa and author and lecturer at North Kent College, Dr. Noor Hassan. A real pleasure to have you join us. Now, let's dive right in. Um, Dr. Hassan, what does the science say about speaking one's mother tongue and its impact on your emotional, intellectual, and other social development? Thanks, thanks for having me on your show. Um, I think there's a lot of being written about um, from the point of view of second language rather than the mother tongue. Right. Uh, I think emphasis is, is based on uh, anyone who speaks, uh, anyone who's bilingual mm -hmm. um, has a, a number of benefits. So the research, if I go through quite a number of research, mm -hmm. there was uh, uh, things being found, accumulated language bonuses, mm -hmm. which means anyone who speaks uh, a multiple language, a bilingual, mm -hmm. will earn more than, than, than the one who speaks a, a, a monolingual. That's an economic benefit. That's an I economic mean, they earn more money. Absolutely, economic okay. benefit. Right. Although I have to emphasize, this was particularly, uh, the emphasis was on the, the European language. Right. The French and the English, and, sorry, French and the English it. and the German and so on. Got so it. On. But within the person, um, if another, per if you speak more than one language, aren't there supposed to be benefits which accrue intellectually, your your capacity for cognitive learning, and so on and so forth? Absolutely. I mean, there was there was another research published in the International Journal of Bilingualism, uh, which talks about anyone who speaks the mother tongue or a second language mm -hmm. has a improved their cognitive because they use the second language or, or the mother tongue um, a, as a memory uh, as, as a memory aid memoir. Okay. Um, so therefore, there, there's a cognitive benefits, there's economic benefits, there's a social benefits. Fantastic. The, okay, let, let, let me come to you, uh, uh, Izzy. Do you speak your mother tongue? No, but I understand it more. So you hear it. I mean, I when people it. are speaking yes. it, um, you will understand yes. the gist of what they're talking about. Absolutely. Do you feel as if you're missing something from not being able to actually you know, go beyond hearing, but also actually communicating it? Absolutely, 100%. And what do you think you're missing? I, I, I miss a sense of belonging sometimes in family functions and events, mm -hmm. or um, it, it becomes that question about, am I British, am I African, right. or Ghanaian for that matter. Okay. Uh, so that's what I feel is missing for me. How does it make you feel? I mean, when that kind of um, conundrum hits you, did, did, what's it's the It's a less than. 
So if I if I'm in Eng if I'm in a family function in England when I was especially when I was younger, right. it would be, oh why don't you know your language? It's you know we speak Ga here and we're going to only speak Ga to you, mm -hmm. and that became a way of learning and understanding, but right. not the confidence to speak. Right, got it. Okay, now um, Noah, if I may, if I may ask you, why are Africans the least likely to speak their mother tongues? Proficiently. After all, uh, you know we've all been through the same colonial experience. Uh, people from Africa, people from Asia, people from the Far East. Many of these people were all colonised by the Brits. But why is it that the Africans have such a hard time speaking their own language? Very good question. I think I think the research is still um, very immature on that right. one. Um, but but I think there's a number of factors which one can draw from that conclusion. Okay. Uh, one is. Uh, those, um, I mean, it, it's really a, a um, uh, it's a tough call when you have the majority of African countries speaking English as their official language. I mean, I can, I can call off the top of my head right. uh, the Nigerians actually have an English as, as, a, as a, sure. an official. Ghana, 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 Ghana. Uh, Kenya, right. Rwanda, right. Uh, the list can go on and on. Right. Um, but again, you can argue the Pakistanis have also the, 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 the English as, as, a, as an official language. Or Indians also, although they have Hindi, they have English as a functioning but language. But if you walk into Asda you, tomorrow, absolutely. I mean, you'll see the Pakistani mum speaking to her little toddler uh, Urdu, uh, in Urdu. And, yes, absolutely. Uh, but I think there's a number of, of factors that one has to look into, and I've done that in, in my research, okay. which is if you look at the, the, the households, right. if you compare to, to two different African household right. and an Asian household, right. what you will see is the Asian household, they still have the extended family. Right. So you have the aunties, the, the grandma, the, grand, right. the grandfather. Right. Still, recently arrived, even if they don't have previously arrived, they still speak the, 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 the heritage language, mm. where kids can pick up. Whereas uh, a, a grandma from Nigeria might still speak English. And if she even were here before the family or the kids were born, she might have came through a visa where she was her herself a professional. Right. Uh, so therefore, there's, there's a lack of social capital in that, in that angle. Right. Um, it could also be recent arrivals. Uh, they prefer the children to pick up the English. Uh, the case of assimilations, okay. making sure that they always speak and, and they do well right. in the language right. because of back home. It, in, the it was a mark of status to be able right. to speak English uh, rather than your own language. Absolutely. Is it, is, is it be, has this hurt? Do you think it has hurt our community? Yes. In what way? I, so from my experience, my parents used Ga at home as a language to communicate with the, between the two of them. Right. And there's four of us. Right. And whilst when we were babies, mm. that was the only tongue we heard. Right. As soon as we went to school, it changed. Right. The reason it has a negative knock-on effect is for those very reasons. I have children and they grew up with children who always spoke different languages. English as a second language, per se. And they seem to do a lot better uh, academically. Okay, I'm going to go to a graphic now, which which talks about here in London the top ten uh, uh, foreign languages which are spoken here in London. Bear in mind that um, uh, black and minority ethnics form forty percent of the yes. population, um, which is three point three million souls in London. Let's have a look along here. Top is Bengali. Mm. This is London. Next is Polish, next is Turkish, Gujarati, Punjabi, Urdu, French, Arabic, Tamil, Portuguese, and lo and behold, not one African language. Does that surprise you, Isabel? That surprises me because I used to work in the NHS right. and that on wards you would hear right. people speaking tree. Right. So, yeah, it surprises It's a fact. Sure. No. Uh, quite surprising, actually. I mean, CityLit is, is, is a very reliable uh, Very source, reliable um, organisation. Um, uh, yeah, and, sure. and I'm afraid, I don't know how they've collected this, this data. Right. Um, but it's, it's quite surprising to, to even not see one, one single... Interesting. Um, I, I, I have another graphic here which i like to uh, go to with actually extending it beyond London now into the whole of the United Kingdom. The top 20 foreign languages, non-British languages, which are spoken are... Obviously, number one is English. Next is Polish, five, four, six thousand, half a million. Do you, do you, does that surprise you at all? Very surprising to me, yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. It doesn't surprise me, actually, because I used to live in Ealing, and everywhere you went, you heard Polish. Mm -hmm. Now, can we go, there's a second page to this. Um, can we go to the second page? There we are. And at number 15, 
in the whole of Britain, highlighted dark, is Somali. That is the only African language in the top 20 of foreign languages spoken in the UK. No. I think, I think my only guess will be, I mean, if you look at the history of Somalia, yes, on the north there was, there was a British, um, a British colony was there, on the south is, is Italian, but, but Somalia predominantly is, is Italian Arabic based uh, language. Maybe that's why the, the, the English has not been as strong as, as, as other African countries. Strongly yeah. assimilated. Yeah. I mean, that, and of course, the there was a huge influx of, yeah. of, of Somalis Recent when, arrivals when their and, yeah, exactly. difficulties so, started over there. But, I uh, want, Isabel, yeah, uh, I, does this make you feel sad? I'm glad it's there. I'm, I'd, I'd rather that there was at least one African language than right. none at all. Right. I think the fact that we still see Somalia, Somalians as still quite new to the UK right. in comparison to other African countries means that it still may be at a very early stage. Let's see what the next couple of generations will do. Will do. But, and but then it is that, also that interesting like. that, that because they're recent uh, immigrants yeah. here, world conditions and world attitudes have changed. Absolutely. And the, the hegemony, if you like, the grip of the English language around the globe mm -hmm. may slowly be receding, Dr. Uh, uh, well, it might well be, but obviously because of the internet and because of, of, because of the, the, the hold uh, now, uh, academic literature, mm. I, I, I think English has, has got to stay there, uh, to be honest with you, in terms of, in terms of hegemonic uh, positioning. Right. Um, uh, so it, it's universal. And, and I think even if you go to Africa, uh, one of the most well-paying jobs are now English-speaking English right. yes. people. Right. So there are even jobs where they don't even ask you any other university, any degrees or any right. other specialism right. other than speaking perfect mm. English. That's um, so, so therefore, yeah. therefore, I mean, there's nothing wrong. I mean, obviously, I am not against it, and you, we are not no, against the, the, the no. English we'll come back. Uh, skills. We'll come back to that. Oh, we'll we'll but, come back yeah. to that in a second. Sure. Look, we're going to take a short break now, but please join us again for part two, where we'll be continuing the conversation. See you in a few minutes. Welcome back to Your Voice with me, Ted Kofi, and my guests, Isabella Kubimensa and Dr. Nur Hassan. Now, we ran an Instagram poll um, and took some comments. Actually, the response to this particular set of comments was the greatest we've ever had. And I just want to read out to you a few of the comments that were made in response to the question, were you embarrassed to speak an African language as a teen? This is young people speaking now. They said... Um, I already had an accent, so I felt uncomfortable that I'd be made fun of. Didn't like it. Um, yep, other African languages got picked on at schools. Um, Patois was always subconsciously intertwined with my African language, said Tyrone Chambers. Um, and then there was another. My Caribbean parents did not want to acknowledge that we were of African origin. I'm learning Kikongo now. That's at Yaya Misps. Now, what is curious is that when you, we ask the same question of adults, we asked, um, as an adult, are you embarrassed to speak an African language in public? Their responses are dramatically different. Now, I'm proud, as I got older, to start to learn my culture mm -hmm. and heritage. That's Tiz 25. Absolutely not. Pride and joy. Now I correct anyone that calls me a French person. That's Beauty by Brenda. Another person said, no, I love speaking in public, to be frank. It's part of my identity. That's Jolene Masasa. And not learning Kikongo of the Congo and show it off at any opportunity to share to date. And that's Yaya Misps. When, see the contrast between Absolutely. when she was young and when she's older. How does this strike you? I think that's a, norm, that's a normal experience. Right. I think most young, really young people don't want to, it's the okay. barrister, but, but actually as I've seen a lot of that growing up, you know, going, getting older and wanting to learn. I think when it was my turn, there wasn't those resources, now there are. Okay, can I, can I, of course, Izzy, you're, a, you're a, a, a children's book author. Yes. And you have re recently launched um, a new book. I have, yes. How does this connect to the question of speaking African languages? Of course, your book is in English, isn't it? 
My book is in English, but what I've taken to doing with specifically with the second book, Adra's Paddling Pool, mm -hmm. is to include symbols, um, Adinkra symbols that right. are, relate to our heritage. Right. Um, because again, for me, the representation is really important. Yes, I can't speak the language, right. but I'm definitely starting the narrative whereby it's going to be okay. So people are going to be more comfortable. You think young children are going to be more I, comfortable I like knowing the icons and the symbols of their heritage? Are there, yes, absolutely. What does the research say about this sort of thing? Uh, uh, there's a few things. Yeah, there's a few things about self-esteem, and right. I think I think it's the opposite to what you've just uh, read from from the comments of the viewers. Okay. Um, uh, there's a, a self-esteem in terms of uh, the at the young age when young African heritage actually go out and visit that grandma grandfather right. heritage. If they go back again to the original country, right. uh, they tend to have a problem in terms of of, of communicating with their yes. uh, extended family. Okay, and that causes a bit of embarrassment. Uh, and I've, I've well, seen amongst the young among people, the you young, mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, while they were still, they didn't want to speak their own mother tongue right. among their friends right. in, in an English setting. Right. But when they go back again to the, the heritage, right. they found that. So therefore, there, there's a there's a, 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 um, uh, an increased evidence right. uh, in the literature that actually kids are now starting to be quite confident speaking in our mother tongue. Right. So there's right. A, there's a, the tide seems to be sort of turning, yes. turning. Uh, around. Yeah. So w what you're saying is that now it's an, a good idea actually to expose the, the young it, children it, of the diaspora it, to elements of their culture. It because is. It the, is. The, it the, is. It yeah, is. It is. And it nowadays, obviously, obviously because, of, because of what's happening now, uh, uh, I think people are trying to catch up with, with, with the heritage it and they're trying to yeah. find, I mean it's not only in Britain but, but if you go to States and the United States of America and other European countries people are trying to yearn uh, going back again to their roots and learning and so on and so forth. So Some of them are even changing their names. Right. Yes, so there's yeah. a renaissance uh, going on right. among, among you know, non-English speakers in okay. terms of the Maritain, that's Maritain. You were educated in this country weren't you? Isabel? I was. Okay. Yes. Um, so how did it feel to perhaps speak um, a form of English which was um, a, a dialect of, of traditional uh, spoken English within the mainstream of society. Whereas within the educational system, you were learning what was called, you know, received pronunciation, quote unquote, posh English, whereas the language you were actually maybe conversing in amongst your peers, even though you didn't speak an African language, was more of a slangy yeah. sort of language. Yeah. What was the impact on your education in that? I think it's I think it's weird for me because we started off my sister and I particularly were in private school so when I did transfer over to what we'd call a state school right. we were sort of seen with as children with plums in our mouths and right. stuff so over time what's happened is is I've actually I actually have a sense of dumbing down for want of a better phrase absolutely when I had co when I had cousins or any friends who came from Ghana right. um, whilst we were in school primary school in particular they would be speaking the Queen's English and couldn't understand why they were getting picked on. Right. So I've right. gone from speaking the Queen's English to being picked on to sort of dumbing down and then having other Ghanaian friends from Ghana right. with, a, with a higher standard of education, if I'm allowed to say that, mm -hmm. coming here being put down a year mm -hmm. because of the assumption of being an African mm -hmm. and then speaking better than me, be better than anybody in the class. Extraordinary, isn't yeah. it? Uh, uh, why, is, why does this happen? Is this a question of, a, is this a hangover from colonial days and the a generally kind of perceived sense that anything that's African is of less worth, less mm. value, and so on? But why does this happen? I, th I think it's, it's you absolutely put it, put it rightly, because um, it's, it's a colonial uh, a leftover. I think it's, it's, a, it's a pressure. It's because one of... Uh, one of the jobs that colonialists did in the first place was to eradicate and destroy and dismantle all traditions and the language and so on and so forth. Remember, Africans are orally rich uh, yes. society. They, they, they use language to communicate, to uh, articulate, to speak and, and so on and so forth. So one of the first things that the, the European uh, colonizers did was actually to dismantle that structure. Um, and I, and uh, I, presumably that would have been a, a strong unifying force and you know, kind of a point of coalition. Uh, absolutely, and then and then and then that that created a stigma because if you if you offered a job in the civil services through the the, the colonial structure right. uh, and and you're earning more, why would you go back again to 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 the language that your ancestors spoke? Right. Where 
Yeah, and of course, would. as a civil servant, you would have to be working uh, in absolutely. English. Absolutely. So, so right. I mean, I I spoke English when I, I I've learned English in Somalia, right. but I came when I came to I already spoke English. I, I thought I spoke um, a very well, good English. I mean, the, the, the received pronunciation you just called it. Right. Um, but when I joined my colleagues here, mm -hmm. uh, s same thing happened. Mm -hmm. uh, people looked at me and it's as if I was pretending to be someone I wasn't. And then I had to really read my lips, if you like, right. uh, and then try and see if I can just uh, stay within the crowd. It's uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a similar experience, although I was older than you actually yeah. when I came here, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's a similar it, it's, it's such a pity that the time has gone so fast, but I'm going to go uh, first from you, uh, Izzy, then to you, uh, Noah. Uh, do you think African, language, African children should learn their ancestral languages even though they're born here and they grew up here and they are effectively British? To be honest, I think our, I would urge all black children to learn an African language because it is about that sense. For me, it is about that sense of belonging. It is When we're going through all these troubles and feeling that Black Lives Matter, for instance, I do think it's important that we have a language. It doesn't matter what African language it is to be personally, right. but it should have one. It, it, so that should, it gives them a sense of belonging sense of. With, the, with the ethnic group and yes. so on and so forth. Yes. Is that partly your mission in creating these books? Well, I wrote the books because my daughter couldn't see herself in school. She was in a school with black children, but she couldn't see herself in the literature. And so we would take an experience from her day at nursery. She's 26 now. We would take an experience and we would write it down and I'd read it to her. And then she had a sense of belonging. I now have a grandchild. I'm not having that happen again. Absolutely. This is a bit of an heirloom. So this can be passed on. Fantastic. Uh, no, do you think African children in the diaspora should learn their uh, ancestral languages? And do you think parents whose children don't speak these ancestral languages should feel as if they've got a little bit more to do? I think they should. I think yes. I'll even go beyond that. I think um, the community leaders should push harder because uh, we can say all day, I mean, we have to learn the language, but if we're not doing an do action, it. if we're mm -hmm. not taking steps towards that, then nothing will happen. I think, I think community leaders should push policy makers to change. And I would go, because we, yes. you and I, we win, win in education, I think we should advocate, uh, petition schools to offer at GCSE level language, exactly. as they do in, in, in Urdu, in Hindi, Indeed. in German, yeah. in, in Arabic, and so on and so forth. Um, therefore, we should to do an action rather than really sit and... So, and I'm so, so basically, that. what you're both calling for is that uh, you don't do actions without spending money. Um, that there should be public money spent on ah, this issue. Absolutely. absolutely. If and you can justify that as something which society would benefit from? Yeah. Absolutely. I don't understand why you, can, why you would have other Asian languages and there's not one, ag one African language on the curriculum. I mean, most, people, most of the people I know, when they're going to learn a language, they're not necessarily going to learn Ga, but even, I've got even Jamaican friends who will pick up tree. Imagine that being taught at GCSE. Just when it's getting interesting, um, I'd like to thank you, Isabel, very much for joining us. Um, Dr. Noor Hassan, thank you. Um, thank you also for joining us. And that's the end of part two. Join us after the break when I'll be joined by Dr. Louise Owusukwate and Na Ajeli Bojo. Thank you very much. Welcome back. You're watching Your Voice with me, Ted Kofi, and my guests for this half are Senior Lecturer at the University of Greenwich, Dr. Louise Owusu-Kwarteng, and Founder of the Gardangme.com group, Na Ajeli Bojo. Ladies, ladies, thank you so much for joining me. Now, the, uh, the first thing I, I need to ask is that um, how, in your experience and based on your research, uh, uh, Louisa, has the pressure to assimilate affected the learning and usage of the African language amongst the African community? Okay, so I look at this sort of um, two generationally. So if I think about, for instance, those children who were born and raised here right. during the 1960s and right. their, our parents came at that time, they came mm -hmm. here as students, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, they came, they were sort of balancing work and then balancing their education. Right. And if they had children, what they were doing was that they were sending their children to foster homes to learn, you, you, well, yes, yeah, just so that they could manage the three things together. And I think at that time, like, assimilation was really, really imp it was. It was the it ultimate was, goal. It was no. the ultimate goal. And I think, you know, the fostering was part of that. I mean, obviously, there was other reasons for it, but it was. Around part about of it. what time period would this so have been? I would say, I would say from the maybe early 1960s to the sort of late 70s, although some people are still doing that now. Right. So I think, you know, there was there was a pressure to it. There were, our parents wanted those children to assimilate. Right. So I think this was part of the reason why they did it. And then also when you look at the broader social context of when they were growing up then, when it was really very badly racist. Right. Um, so again, you know, one of the ways perhaps people navigated that was through trying to assimilate and sometimes it's very very di it's very difficult to do you think it worked i mean in your in the research that you have done yeah. on this i mean what were the human impacts of, of this I sort think, of thing think, on the children well i think there was a lot of them really so first of all if we take the psychological aspect of you know breaking that um attachment bond because a lot of these kids were fostered at sort of from the ages of I don't know, some of them from birth even. So like if they haven't had that attachment to their biological parent, uh, so that's one thing. And then growing up in a context that's very different to them, to, to, to their African culture, this is, and this is gonna have an impact on you emotionally and socially because you don't fit in in any of the two contexts. Now, Jenny, how does that sound to you? Now, this must have been going on before your time mm -hmm. because you would be the generation after, you would have been too young. Yeah. Uh, for this sort of thing to be going on. How does that sound to you? Um, you know, I, I agree with what she's saying, especially in the sense that assimilation, you're coming to a, a new country. And to be honest, it for me, I feel it's like a, a, a kind of safety net right. in that if you were perceived to be too other, there was this, uh, literally, in many cases, a danger to your life. So you almost wanted to assimilate to be safe and seen as not a threat to what would have been termed as British ideals at the time. I also think there was part of it where we kind of, uh, the wanting to assimilate was also us wanting to do that in the sense that culturally, mm -hmm. it's almost like we put the Western culture and ideals on a pedestal. Right. And so we want our children, especially when they go, oh, my children was born and abroad and this is how she is, that's why she doesn't eat that. And, and you say it almost with a kind of pride. pride that your child is not like you. She is more like a, I don't know, African 2.0, another level um, right. kind of assimilation. Right. So I think it's- Westernized you know, African Westernized was, African was kind of pedestalized. Is on a pedestal and you know, more respected. And it was seen that you were more educated as a result. So yes, we had a threat to our life. And, but the other one was we wanted that assimilation so we can prove we have bettered in terms of our next generation. So uh, back in these days, and based on your research, uh, uh, Louisa, um, what were societal values towards African languages? So if a child rocked up in a situation where they were being fostered, presumably it wouldn't have been particularly welcome. No. They would actually have probably actively tried to stop them. No, was it was. Fair? I mean, I, and one of the things was, in a lot of cases, the people that I was speaking to, um, their parents consciously didn't teach them those African languages right. because they were afraid, not only in terms of broader societal um, assimilation and where they were going with the foster homes, mm -hmm. but it was also because they were afraid that, okay, well, if the children learnt two languages, then they're going to get confused. And that, you know, when they go to school, because I think one of the reasons why they went into the foster homes as well was so that they could look supposedly so that they could learn English and engage more in the culture but when they go to school and then you, you know their English isn't very good and it's very mixed up this would impact on their educational attainment in the long run but what obviously one of the reasons why our parents came here was to give themselves and also us the better opportunities. Now Nigel I, I speak three African languages absolutely mm -hmm. fluently the fourth one's a bit ropey but I still get around with great confidence mm -hmm. um, how does this chime with you, the idea that a child need only be raised with one, with one language so that there is a focus on, on proficiency in that language because that's a language that's going to determine the kind of job you're going to get and, and so forget about everything else? 
Um, I think there is a uh, uh, limited understanding in terms of the brains of children because, as I understand it, children can learn up to five languages with no particular issues Side at by all. side. Side by side. Same and time. we can even just look at examples of other um, immigrant, migrant communities to know that some of the highest positions held in the world are held by people who speak more than one language. Absolutely. So that idea, I think, is that it's... I think the people that kind of push that forward, it might be rooted in some element of uh, ignorance and some element of colonial mentality, because I know that there are children who were born speaking the language, mm -hmm. then went to school and were told, and the schools told the parents that they're struggling with the English, and so you might want to consider, you know, and because the parents are not really understanding, they, they would rather opt for you not to learn your language so that you will be able to speak the English well again, because English is being held on the pedestal. Yeah. Louisa, let me come to you on this one. Um, this is the biggest question yeah. when it comes to this issue, is that um, if the children don't speak their native or ancestral languages, um, they become somehow stripped of their cultural identity. Mm. And whereas uh, they will grow up British, holding a British passport, uh, but feeling not quite 100% British or not being accepted by the wider society, but then they haven't got anything else to fall back on because they're alienated from their cultural uh, 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 heritage. What is the impact for the individual and for society based on the work you've done? Okay, so I think for the, indi well, it, l l let's step back really because when we're talking about identity, I think there's lots of different components that make us who we are. I mean, right. obviously, where we're born, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, our heritage is one thing, whether we can speak the language or not. And I think the language does give you that extra element because what it does, it means that you have those particular kind of nuances. You understand certain social situations. So let's just say, for instance, I go to a Ghanaian funeral and if I could speak to you fluently, you know, I would know, OK, I would know what to say. Mm -hmm. I would know how to act. I would mm -hmm. know how to do this, that and the other. So. Yeah. I feel like, for me, mm -hmm. that side of my identity is missing. And this is one thing, again, that people... Because you don't speak say, for yourself. It's not my... Ch my choose... I'm going to admit this on camera. It's not great. Right. It's not great. I mean, right. you know, I could probably... But I mean, you are one of many. Uh, yeah. Uh, you're yeah. not a unicorn at all in that. Yeah. Part. So, I mean, you know, I probably know enough to get by if anyone can understand me. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's not great. But if I was more fluent, I think I would understand them little nuances. So, in that aspect, it, it does feel like... Uh, your identity is kind of missing but then as I say you know there are other facets of your identity and I think when we talk about wider society and especially now like you know the way that black people are being treated in society I think one of the key things is that we really no need to know who we are because I think a lot of the you know some of the problems that we're facing is that like some we were talking about this um in the green room, mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, sometimes people are turning on each other and everything. But I think if we have a sense of who we are, a sense of that would help us to understand where we're going. And I think, you know, language is a very important part of that. Now, Jilly, mm -hmm. what she's saying is that basically uh, people who are connected to their roots, their background, their languages, inter alia, mm -hmm. make better citizens. What was your experience? Because you are self-taught in mm -hmm. Ghana, aren't mm -hmm. you? Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. T tell us about that. Um, it, what's, what's really weird is that I, I learned as an adult and I found that society, um, they are more accepting of uh, Ghana children not being able, born outside of the UK, not mm -hmm. being able to speak, mm -hmm. than Ghana children born outside but not speaking well. You are going to face more trauma mm -hmm. if you don't speak it well rather than if you don't speak it at all. I so I understand what they're, they're saying, but for me, because the importance of the culture I found by by being able to speak the language there was it was the foundation of me understanding even more about my culture I think when you strip the child of the language I think you reduce the whole culture in my in, in my experience to a form of entertainment like many of us we don't speak but we know about the music we know about all the entertainment aspects but when we are looking the about food. the food and things like that but when we're talking about the sciences and the principles and, and the, you know, the socio-economic aspects of our culture, they're underpinned by our language and that shapes the culture. So I feel like when you understand the language, it's like a foundation to understanding a lot more. And when you understand the culture past the entertainment value, because the thing with entertainment and things that entertain, they go out of season. 
So when society decides that African culture is no longer fashionable, a lot of us are going to be like, OK, let's drop our Africanness. But when you understand the foundation and what our ancestors felt, and because and, our language is shaped by our principles yeah. and how we view our society and society for our survival, that is still important to us today. So by understanding that, it doesn't go out of season. Your survival doesn't go out of season. So I think people need to understand that language is more than simply being able to communicate, but it's about understanding the framework and the principles that your people and people who look like you, how they think. You've, you've actually created flashcards which go back to explaining kind of the language, the vernacular, right up to and including the grammar mm -hmm. uh, that's used in the Ga language. Um, mm -hmm. When we come back after the break, um, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll perhaps uh, look into that a little bit more. But that's the end of part three. Join us after the break when we'll be wrapping up the discussion on whether African children in the diaspora should learn their ancestral languages right here on Your Voice. Welcome back. You're watching Your Voice with me, Ted Kofi, and my guests, Dr. Louisa owusu Kwateng and Na Ajeli Gwajo. Now, I should say you're an associate professor, yeah. and, you know, in the academic world, titles are very important. So, so uh, associate professor Louisa owusu Kwateng, let me, let me ask you this. Um, she said something about language and how fundamentally it underpins everything. Do you think parents are aware of the deficit that's left for their children when they don't teach them these languages? I don't. Not, not all. I, actually, I don't want to generalise because some will and then yes. some won't. Right. But I think for a lot of our generation and the generation before, I think mm. they probably just didn't because mm -hmm. I think their focus was that they wanted us to kind of like assimilate and to do as well as we possibly could here. And as I was saying before, I think, you know, there was some concern amongst some of the Ghanaian parents that I spoke, uh, sorry, some of the you know, people that I spoke to, and they were saying that their parents were concerned that, again, you know, there was going to be some kind of confusion. So I don't think, I mean, it's a really tricky one because on the one hand, it was like they wanted us to be sort of like Ghanaian archetypal kids. Right. But then that was the bit that was the big bit that was missing. And I right. don't think they probably realised right. I think there was more focus on behaviour and, right. you know, morals and stuff, but okay. they didn't really think so much about the Of language. the structural, other, other issues that, were, that yeah. followed it. Now, Jelly, what I love is mm -hmm. that you've actually taken this thing one step back. Mm -hmm. um, you've created learning aids as mm -hmm. part of, is it gardangme.com? Yeah, the gardangme.com. Yeah, yeah. And, and what do they do? What's, the, what's their mission and purpose? So, when I was learning to, to speak the language, one of the struggles I had was one, finding resources. Right. Um, and when I did find the resources, the resources weren't catered to people born in the diaspora who would not have engaged certain things. So if you're going to say a proverb in Ga, for example, if I have not seen a calabash before, the proverb is not going to make any sense to Absolutely. me. So I wanted to create a resource that was for such people dealing with the basics of the language and the culture. So essentially what the Gadangme is, is an online resource mm -hmm. for the basics of Gadangme culture, particularly for those born in the diaspora. Right. Um, it, it's so interesting that these things are absolutely um, uh, critical to learning mm -hmm. a language. Now, these are pictures of you mm -hmm. that we're projecting onto the wall. Mm -hmm. What's going on there? So one of the things that I realised when I was learning the culture is that uh, people were very scared for me. Who they were like the, the the community, the Ghanaian community seemed right. to be scared about where I'm going. Okay. One, it's not going to make me any money. Right. Um, two, like I would speak to the priestesses because what I found is that the priestesses and the priests were usually the custodians for a lot of the traditions because mm -hmm. coli during colonizations they were ostracized. So mm -hmm. it's almost like they were allowed to keep certain elements of the culture. And I started to realize that if I really wanted to get down to the sciences and the medicines and stuff, I need to go there. But there was a fear about engaging them. So what I do with these images is I'm almost trying to say, don't be scared. Be yourself and be true to who you are and, and let people see it more often. So in that way, when they see it, they're not scared, especially people in the diaspora, because that kind of fearful mentality passes down to it, the children. And I'm challenging that, essentially. Uh, 
Very well done. Um, it, it brings me to another question, is, which is that one of our polls that we did on Instagram, and the response to it was really quite strong. Um, do you think African languages are respected in the UK? And we have three of our, of, of our response, uh, respondents saying, not at all, and it's a shambles. That's Dana Byfield. Um, it's a no-brainer. Um, nobody likes it. That's uh, uh, Fifi, Orly, Fifi Orleans Lindsay, and anything non-English isn't respected in the UK unless they can take over and manipulate it. That's Tyrone Chambers. So do you think African language is respected by British culture? Okay, so for instance, a uh, couple of things here. So widely, no. I mean, when you look at, for instance, when you go to school, you're not taught anything. You're taught, I learned French, where you can speak German, perhaps you, now you can do Spanish and Mandarin, mm -hmm. but that's not considered. But then that said... What's not considered? I mean, so like an African language, language wouldn't, be not it wouldn't be considered. It wouldn't even, we don't even go there. Mm -hmm. But then that said, I can see little pockets of something else happening. Mm -hmm. So now that, as you were saying, I think now it's becoming cooler to be African. OK, right. it's becoming more accepted and right. definitely down here. I mean, obviously, popular culture has had a big thing there. And I feel, still believe that we need to go a bit deeper culturally. and see. But what I'm seeing is what I, uh, there's a researcher, his name's called Les Back. And mm -hmm. Les Back did a piece of research in southeast London. And he was just kind of talking about the ways that, you know, children from all different ethnic backgrounds, Vietnamese, white, African Caribbean, they all mixed together and mm -hmm. they had what he called cultural syncretism. So that's whereby, you know, you're all taking different bits of each other's culture and la language is one of them. Mm -hmm. So it's mixing kind of like, you know, Patwa and Jamaican, pop, um, sorry, Cockney mm -hmm. to, to come up with a whole new language. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that now. I'm kind of seeing that now because we're seeing more, it's certainly Southeast anyway, I'm seeing more you know, kids from all different backgrounds using kind of like little African words here and there. And, you know, I remember once I was coming in from Lewisham and I was just sitting on the train and I heard these kids from all these different backgrounds using words like wahala, you know, like, you know, some odd chew words. I was like, wow, this is deep. So on the ground level, I mm -hmm. think, you know, like with the younger generation, I think it's there. There's a cultural syncretism, but it needs to kind of come up a bit more. The, the, now, Jelly, um you have made this journey mm -hmm. um, of cultural awakening in mm -hmm. yourself. It involved you changing your name, did it? Yes. What happened? So I think as I learned more about my culture, I, I was more proud. I became more proud who I am. I wanted to share who I am with the world. I wanted people to see what it was about. You know, I was seeing lots of young people wanting to do the same thing. And I realized that my ancestors came up with something that was so amazing. Mm -hmm that I just wanted to embody it everywhere I go. Mm -hmm. And then I also felt like one of the biggest things is that how somebody calls you and how you respond. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to respond to a name that originated from my colonizers. Mm -hmm. If somebody was going to call me and call my spirit and call my body, it was going to be something that represented me and my ancestors. So as an adult, I decided, you know what, I'm going to change my name. That's the first thing. So now when people call... What were you called before? I was now? called Carol. <laughs> Excuse me? Carol. Do I look like a Carol? <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, I was called Carol before. Um, and then about eight years ago, I legally changed my name to Nigeli because that, that is my name. That is my heritage. That you cannot argue with. That is my bloodline. You cannot take that away from me. And that is who my, I am. And so it literally is almost like a prayer every time someone calls my name. Hmm. Now, in the first part, we had Dr. Noor Hassan here, um, who's done some research. And he quoted other bits of research, which indicated that the intellectual and emotional development of people who speak what they call their mother tongue, um, the first language they, they hear when they're born, uh, and who are educated in it, uh, uh, greatly enhance. I'm going to ask about what it would do for African children in the diaspora if they spoke their languages as citizens. As we know, we have huge issues around uh, our contacts with the police. We have huge issues around stop and search. We have, you're an academic, we have huge issues around um, academic performance at GCSE level, at university level, and certainly um, Africans in the diaspora need to be tilting at the elite 
imperial colleges, Oxford universities, Cambridges, as well as the other universities. So what do you think, speaking their own native language, how can that affect all of those other outputs? Okay, so I think um, generally one, one thing that we, well, you, we are talking to colleagues who actually teach language, one of the things that we always say is to have another language is a really, really important thing. So culturally, it's important. Spiritually, it's important. But then also, when it comes to kind of like employment, if you can say that you can speak another language or like if you're applying to go to another university, then I think that is go that's going to look really good on your CV. So I think that's one thing. But then also, I mean, aside from all of that, I think when you go home, that's, you know, that, that means that you can sort of like engage a little, a lot more with the culture than if we don't speak it at all. And I think you had, when you were talking about police and one of the things that just kind of popped up in my mind was immigration. Right. So, you know, I've heard of story, of, I've heard of um, situations where, I, I mean, even I was approached myself when someone sort of said that, you know, when you've got Ghanaians coming through the system and stuff, mm -hmm. we need somebody to be able to translate mm -hmm. into the language. When mm -hmm. I was working at the Home Office, and right. again, you know, we had to, they were dealing with things like around religion and, right. you know, engaging in those communities. So it's useful in terms of employment, but then also it's useful in, on a kind of personal level. Let me go to um, a couple of the polls that we ran. Um, uh, one of them uh, was about young people and um, old people, about older people, yeah. about speaking an African language. We asked, were you embarrassed to speak an African language as a teen? 46% um, said yes, and 54% uh, said no. Then as an adult, are you embarrassed to speak an African language in public? Only 3% said yes. A resounding 97% said they were not at all embarrassed to speak an African language as an adult. What's going on there? Najeli, explain. I think part of it is now the society seeing being an African as being more fashionable. Um, and so it is becoming more acceptable to express your Africanness, whether it be your language or the way you speak or the foods that you eat. Um, but I also think that as you get older and you realise and you're shaping your identity and you realise that this is an essential part of your identity and you're trying to shape yourself as an individual, you want to have the opportunity to express that and language is one of those ways of doing that. Fantastic. Yeah. We're, we're really coming to the, the end of our discussion today. Mm. Very quickly now, um, uh, Associate Prof. Louisa, tell me, should Africans learn their cultural languages, yeah. their ancestral languages. Yes, I, I think they should. Is it worth public money being spent on? Absolutely, absolutely. Same question for you, Najeli. Do you think that parents should ensure that their children mm -hmm. in the diaspora mm -hmm. learn their ancestral languages? Yep. I feel that they should see speaking their language just as important as instilling moral code. So just as how you would engage the child in making sure they grow up morally right and upstanding is the same way you should invest time and energy into making sure that your child can speak your ancestral language. Najeli, Prof. Louisa, yeah. sadly, we have run out of time. Um, that's all we have time for on this edition of Your Voice. Thank you to my guests in this part, Dr. Louise Owusu-Kwate and Najeli Bojo. And of course, to my earlier guests, Dr. Nur Hassan and Isabella Kwubi Mensa. And thank you for watching. I'm Ted Kofi. Please join us again next time here on Your Voice. It seems extraordinary that there's nothing that the coronavirus doesn't touch. We all see Black Lives Matter demonstrations. Oppression is brought out. So unfortunately, I just feel like we're, we're going down this road. We've been down this road before.